On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including NASA's scrubbed SLS wet dress rehearsal, some updates on the new Starship launch pad, NASA's science chief prefers used SpaceX boosters, China's Shenzhou 13 mission successfully returns, and a near-fatal mistake at Python Space's test range. There's lots to go over this week, so let's get going. This is The Space Race. Some extra bumps this week for NASA's Artemis 1 wet dress rehearsal, as a third attempt had to be cut short due to continued issues with the plumbing of the space launch system. Early on April 14th, NASA started loading the core stage of SLS with fuel as planned. However, the crew was forced to pause several times as issues cropped up over the course of the day, until a liquid hydrogen leak forced a full scrub at around 4 p.m. The original plan for Thursday was to make a modified attempt to fill SLS, as about a week before this, an attempt had to be halted due to a valve malfunction. Instead of wheeling the whole rocket back into the vehicle assembly building, it was decided that they would wait until after the launch of Axiom 1 and attempt another fill test, bypassing the malfunctioning valves in favor of at least testing the other tanks while they still have the stack ready to go. But, unfortunately, things didn't go according to plan. More systems began failing as attempts to fill the SLS's tanks uncovered more malfunctions. Here's how it happened. A slow fill of liquid oxygen started getting pumped into the core stage at around 9.30 a.m. But soon after that, the first halt was called as controllers spotted temperature limits being exceeded. It took a couple of hours, but a workaround was hashed out, and at about noon, liquid oxygen started flowing again. Not long after that, the liquid hydrogen started pumping. But controllers hit the brakes soon after a dangerous pressure surge was detected during the speed increase of the pumps. Controllers decided to stop the liquid oxygen flow entirely while they worked the hydrogen problem, and decided to try another modification, this time to the liquid hydrogen's fast fill. But that's about when the leak was discovered. The umbilical line connecting the core stage to the launch platform's tail service mast began leaking liquid hydrogen, forcing another stop. After a couple of hours of trying to work the problem, NASA officially scrubbed the test at around 4 p.m. So now with all of their attempts foiled by malfunctions and leaks, there's nothing to do but pack up the SLS rocket and Orion spacecraft and tow it all back to the VAB. In an update on Monday afternoon, NASA officials announced that preparations would begin to ready the SLS and mobile launcher for transport back to the assembly building, which would happen next Tuesday, April 26th. NASA officials cited three major priorities that will be tackled. Fixing the valve issue on the upper stage, locating and repairing the hydrogen leak on the launch unit, and working with the nitrogen supplier to increase the capabilities for liquid nitrogen delivery. It sounds like best case scenario, this will take a matter of weeks to correct, so NASA officials have confirmed that the early June launch window is not going to happen. There will be two more opportunities this summer, from June 29th to July 12th, and then from July 26th to August 9th, but no definitive word was given for when Artemis 1 might be launch ready. So what do you think this means for Artemis's timeframe? Let us know in the comment section below. While things appear to be falling apart with the SLS, SpaceX is making big strides in their Starship program. Work has been picking up swiftly at NASA's Kennedy Space Center, where previous attempts to construct a launch pad were abandoned in 2019 in favor of working on Starship prototyping. Now, the Site-39A pad is seeing work that shows the benefits of the lessons SpaceX learned in the meantime, and it all starts with Starbase's first orbital launch site. The orbital launch site began construction in late 2020, and while the new pad at Kennedy closely mirrors the Starbase launch facility, there are some clear differences that likely came from logistics problems discovered during the OLS construction. The biggest change is that the tower is now being built in smaller sections. Starbase's Mechazilla Tower was constructed in chunks of two or three sections at a time, before moving on to the one, stacking as they went. This was very efficient to complete, but SpaceX workers had to then spend months afterwards 
rigging the plumbing, wiring, and bits of other structure needed, having to work on delicate systems as the tower climbed higher and higher. The new launch pads tower takes advantage of the Roberts Road facility at Kennedy Space Center, the one where SpaceX has been processing their Falcon rockets and staging their Starship parts lately. Here, they decided it would be safer to construct as much of each tower section as possible, plumbing, wiring, and all, before shipping the pieces to the Cape and assembling them there. This will make things easier for the technicians, who won't have to do so much plumbing and electrical work while the tower is already standing. The early pictures of work at Cape Canaveral show that the new launch pad has its four concrete legs installed already, and the steel frame is taking shape. This took about two weeks, and then two weeks after that, three sections have their basic structure completed, and a fourth has started. If things keep at this pace, we might actually see a Starship launch capable platform within the 6 to 12 month window SpaceX is gunning for. Speaking of SpaceX, it seems industry professionals are being won over by the consistency of the Falcon 9 boosters. In a tweet on April 8th, NASA's Dr. Thomas Zerbukin, Associate Administrator for NASA's Science Mission Directorate, praised the Axiom-1 mission's booster landing on the Gravitas drone ship, which isn't particularly out of the ordinary. NASA's been using flight-proven boosters for missions since 2017, and now most of SpaceX's contracts are carried out on their used boosters, the most flown of which has an impressive 12 launches under its belt. But the exciting part came next, when Dr. Zerbukin said this, even though I was always excited about utilizing flown SpaceX boosters on principle and also the impact on mission cost, I have changed my opinion about them slightly. I now prefer previously used boosters over totally new ones for most science applications." End quote. The reliability of the Falcon 9 boosters is undeniable at this point, but we should remember that the SpaceX team had to work hard to get the tech to this point. And I imagine it must feel really good to have that work acknowledged by one of NASA's directors. We've got good news from China as their Shenzhou 13 mission was completed with the successful landing of their crew capsule. The spacecraft carrying three Chinese astronauts touched down safely in northern China's Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region on April 15th after spending a record six months in orbit aboard the new Tiangong space station. The previous Chinese record was Shenzhou 12, which spent 92 days aboard the station last year. Crew members Wang Yaping, Yi Guangfu, and Zhe Ji Gang spent the time on the Tianhe core module, Wang herself making more history for the Chinese space program by becoming the first ever woman to live aboard the Tianhe and the first Chinese woman to take a spacewalk. Some of you might be aware that six months is about the average time a mission to the International Space Station runs for, with some longer ones taking a year, but this is a big deal for the Chinese space program. It signifies that their tech and their Taikonauts, that's what their space service folks are called, are ready for bigger missions and are already operating at close to the same capacity as the aging ISS. The three Taikonauts spent the mission time doing the usual low Earth activities, performing two spacewalks, working on 20 experiments, and delivering two live lectures. Though we're not sure exactly when China plans to expand the station, we know they plan on launching two modules this year sometime. We do know that the next crewed mission, Shenzhou 14, is scheduled to launch in early June. And to finish off this week, we have an entry into what not to do when testing rockets. Python, a rocket startup from California, made some waves in the space community on April 10th when Eric Berger of Ars Technica tweeted out a video of a Python test going wrong. The video shows a test of Python's micro jump rocket that begins billowing out green smoke to such a degree that several nearby crew are seen fleeing for safety. Python quickly pulled the Vimeo hosted video, but it had already been posted on YouTube and circulated around. Several experts, Bergen included, critique Python's safety procedures. This video is a masterclass in how not to do rocket science, Bergen said. Python fired back with a lengthy update on their website, reinstating the original video and berating their critics. 
The Post states that this sort of scary part is swept under the rug in the aerospace industry and insinuated that people were blowing this incident out of proportion. According to Python, the rest of the staff had been pulled back 500 meters away behind a hill, and the three personnel in the video had been taking cover behind 10 feet of gravel, all according to a reported eight-page checklist from the FAA's launch requirements that they developed from their time at the DARPA launch challenge. Dangers were downplayed, making reference to the founders' experience in dangerous situations like mountain climbing and the quick and cheap nature of their builds ending with an appeal to the audience that we shouldn't allow just billionaires and formal aerospace engineers to lead our way to space. And look, if things were as Python reported, and this looks worse than it is, then that would be one thing. But to respond to criticism with a statement filled with machismo and condescension for seasoned space community members is just a little bit tone deaf. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it, that really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.